There's a lot for the Finance Committee to discuss on the topic of manufacturing. And I want to start off with a little bit of recent uh, history on key manufacturing issues. On infrastructure, and we know you can't have big league manufacturing with little league infrastructure, it was a running joke during the Trump administration that every week was infrastructure week. The big infrastructure bill was just a few days away. It was kind of like the marquee at the old movie house where it always said, coming soon, but it just never actually got there. It was the Biden administration that finally got a major infrastructure bill passed. Now there's shovels in the ground all over the country working on rebuilding our roads and bridges, highways, ports, and airports. On energy, former President Trump talked again a big game on energy independence. Had he wanted, he could have pushed for big investments in batteries and wind and solar and electric vehicles. He passed on that one too. Democrats got that done in the Inflation Reduction Act. The United States now produces more energy than ever before. And we've achieved a greater level of energy independence than we had, have had since the days when millions of Americans had big piles of coal shoveled in their basements. Consumers are saving money. Putin and OPEC have a whole lot less influence over our energy prices than they did when former President Trump was in the White House. On semiconductors, these are the chips that Americans interact with from the time they wake up in the morning and check their cell phones to the time they go to bed at night setting an alarm. Once again, Donald Trump was on the sidelines. He could have pushed for more chips investment to bring a vital high-tech manufacturing industry back home, giving us a better and stronger competitive edge with China. Once again, it didn't get done. The Chips and Science Act passed on a bipartisan basis under the Biden administration is getting it done. Nobody would blame Americans for having grown tired and frustrated after years of empty political promises about bringing manufacturing and employment back home. Every shuttered factory, every job shipped overseas was a painful wound to those who were left behind in communities that took pride and found identity in the things they made with their labor. Donald Trump talked an awful lot about bringing manufacturing jobs home. Once again, failure to deliver. In fact, the manufacturing sector went into a recession in 2019 after his tax law went into effect and before the pandemic clobbered our economy. So let's look at what's <clears throat> happening now. The cycle of empty promises has ended. The US is in a manufacturing boom, thanks in large part to this large landmark legislation passed under the Biden administration, much of which came from this committee. Manufacturing investment in clean energy in 2023 was triple the level from before Congress passed the IRA. The running total of clean energy and chips investments announced in this room, few, announced in the last few years is now more than $350 million. That's more than a quarter million jobs created. That was an effort that Democrats pushed vigorously with a private sector market-oriented, no mandates, technology-neutral system that finally broke the gridlock on climate and is producing big investments in the private sector for cleaner uh, energy. The CHIPS Act and the IRA went further than any laws in recent memory to buy America and cut our dependence in China. That's a big reason why so many foreign governments come to town and talk about how upset they are after Democrats passed the IRA. My response to them is, why don't you all go do what we did in your country? I think you'll find it works. With one single piece of legislation, the US lapped the pack in terms of investment in clean energy and clean transportation. So that's all solid news about the state of manufacturing in America. Here's the big concern. Former President Trump wants the IRA repealed. House Republicans voted to gut nearly the entire IRA energy package. It's not because they got a better idea for energy or manufacturing. It's because they wanted to score a political win no matter the cost. And in this case, the cost would be hundreds of thousands of jobs in America. It would be higher costs for consumers, greater dependence on foreign oil, 
surrendering to China and other countries when it comes to clean energy innovation and jobs. We have to make sure that doesn't happen. For the first time in a long time, the future of manufacturing in America and manufacturing jobs looks bright. Congress has to do everything it can do to build on this progress. On that topic, the Senate is in the middle of a debate that pairs tax cuts for businesses, including research and development expenses with an expansion of the child tax credit. I proposed this bill with Chairman Jason Smith of the House Ways and Means Committee several months ago. The House passed it six weeks ago with 357 votes in favor. I think it would be fair to say you can't get 357 members of the House of Representatives to agree that one plus one equals two. That is an extraordinary vote. Both sides of the aisle almost unanimous in saying that we want to be there for 16 million kids of modest incomes who right now are discriminated against if they come from a large family. And then they said we wanted to be there for our small businesses that desperately need that research and development money to make payroll. The Senate has to get this done. I've said it now for weeks and weeks. I will talk to anybody who wants to work in good faith to move this forward quickly. Because right now, folks, let's make sure everybody understands what's going on. Right now, millions of small businesses, millions of families, they're all waiting. They're waiting to see if the United States Congress is going to be there for them. It seems like the Congress can be there for lots of other causes. Now let's make sure they're there for those scores and scores of small businesses and those millions of families that are uh, wait, waiting. I've heard from those small business owners that if the Senate sits on this issue until 2025, a lot of them aren't going to be around to talk about that. They just won't be here. They won't make it. So the time to act is now. And I continue to be open to all sides who want to work in good faith to get this done. Some of my colleagues understand the urgency here. And let's understand that this set of policies isn't going to be on the table in 2025 if this bill stalls out. So it's my hope, and I think we'll hear today, that the American people, again, another important group of Americans, want the Senate to move soon. Senator Crapo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> During last Thursday's State of the Union address, using fair share rhetoric, President Biden laid out his plans for making American manufacturers more competitive. Tax them more, a lot more. President Biden's proposed 28% corporate rate and about 32% when including state taxes would leave the U.S. with one of the highest rates in the developed world. It gets worse. Biden would also hike the Democrats' book minimum tax, a fundamentally flawed proposal which harms American manufacturers by 40% to 21%. Contrast that vision with what the Republicans actually did in 2017. Prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the U.S. had one of the highest corporate income tax rates among developed countries. In 2017, Republicans lowered the rate and broadened the base, putting a stop to corporate inversions. It led to one of the strongest economies in generations prior to the pandemic. Unemployment dropped to a 50-year low. Economic gains flowed to all demographic groups and all income levels, and American businesses reported record R&D investment. In the words of former President Obama's economic advisor, Jason Furman, taxes do actually matter. In response to a recent study on the impact of the TCJA's policy changes on domestic investment, Furman stated these are the most convincing estimates of the response of investment to corporate tax rates that I have ever seen. I agree, tax rates actually do matter. A competitive tax system is instrumental in manufacturers' decisions of where to invest. 
reducing business tax rates paired with pro-growth policies like immediate expensing of capital investments drove historic growth in the manufacturing sector. According to the National Association of Manufacturers, in 2018, the year immediately following the TCJA's enactment, manufacturing had the best year for job creation in 21 years. Manufacturing wages grew at the highest level in 15 years. Manufacturing capital investment grew by 4.5%, and manufacturing production grew 2.7% with December 2018 being the best month for manufacturing output since May 2008. Stability of tax policy is also key to maintaining strong manufacturing in the United States. We must protect the TCJA's pro-growth tax policies and seek to make them permanent before they expire in 2025. We should also look to improve and build on those policies to ensure that U.S. companies and workers can continue to compete globally. Another area of continued bipartisan interest is bolstering the domestic supply chain of semiconductors. American semiconductor manufacturers represented here today by OnSemi are operating in an increasingly competitive market. While we must be circumspect when considering industry-specific tax incentives, bolstering domestic manufacturing of semiconductors is vital to safeguarding our national security. Chairman Wyden and I have worked closely over the years on proposals to strengthen the U.S. semiconductor supply chain. The Advanced Manufacturing Investment Credit, the AMIC, is the result of that bipartisan effort and has already led to increased investment across the United States. In my home state of Idaho, Micron announced that it will construct a new memory chip plant, the first new memory semiconductor manufacturing fab built in the U.S. in the last 20 years. This expansion ensures the semiconductor industry will continue to innovate and develop new technologies that keep Idaho and the country on the leading edge for research and development. In contrast to this bipartisan effort, the costs of the Inflation Reduction Act and the energy incentives contained in it have quickly mushroomed from the original JCT score of $270 billion over 10 years to a June 2023 estimate of $663 billion. One of our witnesses today will discuss his experience with how the administration is proposing to implement these incentives in a way that bolsters China and foreign manufacturing. Unfortunately, he's not alone. Hundreds of domestic stakeholders have provided formal comments to various proposed energy incentive rulemakings, which express significant concerns with the implementation of those energy incentives, including two other witnesses here today. Congress should closely scrutinize a law that both costs much more than promised and also fails to achieve key goals, like making the U.S. less reliant on our adversaries. I look forward to discussing how we can continue to encourage domestic manufacturing activity, including addressing the global semiconductor shortages and supply chain issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. All right. Um, let's introduce our witnesses now. Uh, Mark Widmer is here, the CEO of First Solar. Uh, I know my colleague, Senator Brown, uh, very much wanted to be here to introduce you. He's chairing a hearing in the Banking Committee this morning and will be here later. Anna Fendley is the United States Steelworkers Directory of Regulatory and State Policy. We welcome her. Shannon Janis is Vice President of Global Tax for OnSemi. Courtney Silver is President and Owner of Ketchy Inc. Our final witness is Peter Huntsman, the chairman, president, and CEO of Huntsman Corporation. And I want to, at this time, also publicly acknowledge all the work that Mr. Huntsman has been, done, been doing for years in mental health. We understand the Huntsman family and the Wyden family that this takes an enormous toll on millions of Americans. It's not the topic of conversation today, but... Uh, we just want you to know we're very appreciative of the efforts that you've made and have 
made working with me specifically and look forward to continuing that work. All right, <clears throat> let's go uh, and begin with you, Mr. Widmer. All right, good morning, uh, Chair Whiting, uh, Ranking Member Crapo, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, my name is Mark Widmar, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of First Solar, the Western Hemisphere's largest solar manufacturer. We have over six gigawatts of operational capacity in Ohio, and new factories under construction in Alabama and Louisiana that are expected to take us to 14 gigawatts of capacity in the U.S. and 25 gigawatts cumulative global capacity by 2026. Our proprietary, uniquely American thin film solar technology was developed here in the U.S. and is manufactured in fully vertically integrated factories that produce thin film solar wafers, cells, and modules in a single process entirely under a factory's roof. First Solar is enabled by thousands of hardworking people across the country. Soda ash miners in Wyoming, silicon miners in Michigan, copper miners in Utah, steel workers in Alabama, Louisiana, and Ohio, glass workers in Illinois, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, woodworkers in Indiana, and a nationwide network of truckers, rail workers, and many more. Given this content, it's an honor to represent First Solar today, and I thank the committee for convening this hearing on how tax policies impact domestic manufacturing in the U.S. We applaud the IRA and believe it represents America's first durable solar industrial strategy. Implementation of the IRA, consistent with its legislative intent and the establishment of restrictions to prevent companies controlled or owned by the Chinese government from receiving American taxpayer dollars, together with effective enforcement of trade law, gives the, the potential to dismantle China's near complete control of the solar supply chain and enable the United States to secure its clean energy manufacturing base while capturing economic value and creating good paying enduring jobs. Not only did the IRA provide CapEx-based grants to enable the setup of onshore manufacturing, but through supply-driven advanced manufacturing tax credits, the IRA took on the complex challenge of incentivizing the operational side of manufacturing in strategic clean energy sectors. This provides solar, wind, battery storage, and other manufacturers the momentum needed to scale domestically, drive down costs, and spur cycles of innovation to maintain American technology leadership. The IRA also created a crucial parallel demand side driver to incentivize purchasing the output of these American factories by introducing a bonus to the investment tax or production tax credit accessed by solar generation asset owners if projects procure domestically made content, including solar panels. While regulations to implement this aspect of the IRA remain pending, the domestic content bonus is expected to create a durable market pull for solar produced via high value domestic manufacturing. It is difficult to overstate the IRA's economic potential. And First Solar provides a case in point. Analysis shows that First Solar's US-based footprint alone will support an estimated 30,000 direct, indirect, and induced jobs in 2026, representing approximately 2.8 billion in annual labor income, while generating over 10 billion in economic output in 2026 alone. While we're not the only American solar manufacturer to come into existence at the end of the last century, the grim reality is that we are the only one of scale to remain today. It is therefore imperative that America's response to China's dominance of the solar industry is not a one-horse race. Consider this, solar is already the lowest cost form of new electricity generation, and the IRA offers a catalyst for unprecedented growth in high-value domestic solar manufacturing. And yet the solar manufacturing industry remains in a precarious position today. Less than a third of the 35 gigawatts of new solar installed in 2023 in the U.S. were produced here. None, not one of the crystalline silicon panels installed was assembled with American-made solar cells. Relentless Chinese anti-competitive behavior has caused a significant collapse in cell and module pricing. This dynamic goes well beyond just a risk to our company, it threatens the viability of all aspiring U.S.-based manufacturers who may never be able to finance 
the startup or growth of their operations. The U.S. tax code through legislation such as the IRA has the power to incentivize domestic investment, but for those investments to endure, they must be supported by corresponding strong and consistent enforcement of trade. And there, and there should be no doubt, we invite competition and free trade. All we ask is this competition and trade are the practice on a level playing field. On behalf of First Solar, I'm pleased to participate in this important discussion, and thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Widmar. Ms. Fenley. Good morning. On behalf of the members of the United Steelworkers Union, I'd like to thank Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and the members of the committee for holding this hearing and for the invitation to testify. Our members manufacture a wide array of products in some of the most advanced facilities in the world. Their jobs are the sort that built the middle class. We appreciate that this committee has spent many years considering developing and overseeing initiatives to grow U.S. manufacturing. Through the Infrastructure Law, the CHIPS Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act, Congress has enacted a once-in-a-generation investment in industry. And these efforts have already led to a boom in spending on manufacturing construction. While I will only discuss a few tax credits in my testimony, they are part of an interlocking series of policies necessary for manufacturing workers. The first provision I would like to highlight is the Section 45X Advanced Manufacturing Production Credit. Our union was particularly supportive of efforts to create this tax credit to reshore solar manufacturing capacity after the majority of it was lost to China, to ensure that a new domestic offshore wind industry is supplied by US-made components, and to boost the production of critical minerals for batteries in this country. We are grateful for the careful work being done by the Internal Revenue Service to implement this provision so far, including efforts to solicit public input on certain key questions. The implementation of this credit is an iterative, as yet incomplete process, and our union has offered supportive comments on some provisions and suggestions to the agency on others in the recent comment period. However, we are very excited about the prospect of this credit to help build U.S. supply chains for clean technologies. The second credit to discuss is the Section 48C Qualifying Advanced Energy Product Credit. Our union supported 48C when it was originally enacted in 2009. The revival and expansion of 48C will advance decarbonization efforts through the domestic manufacture of energy technologies and in direct efforts to decarbonize industrial processes. We applaud the expanded list of technologies that Congress included in the credit this time. We also applaud Congress's direction to allot 40% of the funding to designated energy communities which will ensure that the benefits accrue to those communities and workers that may suffer the most harm from the loss of fossil fuel jobs. As expected, the appetite for this credit has been huge. With the first round of applications for $4 billion in credit availability, attracting concept papers seeking $42 billion in funding. This is not a surprise given how oversubscribed 48C was in 2010. Because awarding of the 48C credit functions more like a grant process than a typical tax credit, I would be remiss not to mention the ro important role that the Department of Energy is playing. Our union strongly supports the work that DOE has done to include community benefits plans into the scoring criteria. This process requiring labor engagement has helped drive very productive conversations between our members and their employers. And I'm sure I join most in this room in looking forward to learning which projects are selected in this first tranche of funding. These two credits are both supply side drivers. They will help producers make things. But in order to be fully effective, producers need certainty. Even with a tax credit, these projects are not free and undertaking them entails risk. That risk can be mitigated by demand side drivers that give producers confidence that there will be a stable market for their products. These are somewhat new to the tax code. The Inflation Reduction Act included a bonus credit for clean energy projects that use American iron, steel, and manufactured goods. And the Section 30D tax credit now includes requirements for vehicle assembly and provisions around critical mineral and battery production. We strongly support these provisions. Additionally, we must have strong trade enforcement, a topic also under this committee's jurisdiction. This is an exciting time for American manufacturing. The transition to a clean energy economy will result in lots of jobs somewhere in the world, and we want them to be jobs for American workers. Still, there is a lot of work before us. Implementation of the credits is not yet complete, and arguably more could be done to engage small and mid-sized manufacturers to ensure that this opportunity is broadly shared. 
We look forward to continued work with you, the administration, our employer partners, and others on these matters. Thank you for your interest in our union's perspective and for the opportunity to testify today. Thank, thank you, Ms. Fenley. And not a week goes by when Senator Casey and Senator Brown make some of the very same points that you've made today. And we're going to stay at it until those hopes for steelworkers in manufacturing communities are realized. Thank you. OK, but we're now going to hear from Ms. Janice. Chairman Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and members of the committee, Thank you for the invitation to testify today. My name is Shannon Janis, Vice President of Global Tax at OnSemi. I'm here today to share what we do at OnSemi and discuss how U.S. tax policy shapes our decisions regarding domestic manufacturing. OnSemi is a Fortune 500 semiconductor company with over 4,000 employees in the U.S. We specialize in delivering industry-leading intelligent power and sensing solutions that greatly improve the safety, sustainability, and power efficiency of end products in the automotive and industrial markets. We operate 19 manufacturing sites across eight countries worldwide. These sites consist of front end materials and wafer fabrication facilities known as fabs, as well as back end assembly and test site facilities. In the US, our materials and fab operations are located in five states, Oregon, Idaho, Pennsylvania, New York, and New Hampshire. Each of these sites are an integral part of OnSemi's global manufacturing network. Our wafer fab in Gresham, Oregon is OnSemi's third largest fab globally. The Gresham fab employs over 600 people. Over 50% of Gresham's volume supports the automotive market with over 35 different technologies manufactured at this site. Our wafer fab in Nampa, Idaho employs over 260 people and supports the image sensor business. Image sensors are a key component in machine vision cameras, including digital and security cameras. Our Mountaintop Pennsylvania fab employs over 240 people making power semiconductors and is the only union fab in the US. Our East Fishkill, New York fab is on semi's largest manufacturing facility in the US, employing over 1,000 people and it is the only 12 inch power discrete and image sensor fab in the US. And our Hudson, New Hampshire facility is the cornerstone of OnSemi's silicon carbide products. Today, OnSemi is the only US-based company that has fully integrated end-to-end -end silicon carbide manufacturing. And why is this important? Silicon carbide semiconductors play a pivotal role in enabling the transition to electric vehicles and renewable energy systems. Manufacturing silicon carbide semiconductors is more complex than traditional semiconductors due to higher temperatures, specialized equipment, and unique expertise. We are proud that our New Hampshire site enables our network of factories to deliver the end-to-end -end silicon carbide power solutions necessary for EVs, hybrid vehicles, and renewable energy. As this committee is aware, the steady decline in the United States share of worldwide semiconductor manufacturing capacity poses a risk to America's supply chains and our national security. This decline has been decades in the making and will require persistent attention to achieve a sustainable reversal. A key contributing factor to this decline has largely been due to the su substantial manufacturing incentives offered by the governments of our global competitors, placing the US at a competitive disadvantage. Additionally, federal investments in semiconductor research have historically been flat as a share of GDP. While other countries have prioritized investments in R&D initiatives to strengthen their own semiconductor capabilities, our U.S. R&D tax incentives have lagged behind those of other countries. Although the U.S. has taken the initial steps to curb this decline, other countries, both within the European Union, as well as countries such as South Korea, Japan, and China, are significantly increasing their investments in the semiconductor industry and its workforce. Many of these countries have legislation similar to the CHIPS Act to support their domestic companies as well as incentivizing other companies to invest in their regions. The CHIPS Act, and in particular, the Section 48D Advanced Manufacturing Tax Credit, have played a critical role in enhancing the global competitiveness of the U.S. The enactment of the Chips and Science Act was a landmark step towards reinvigorating domestic semiconductor manufacturing and innovation. The mission is clear. Establishing our leadership role is vital for the U.S. to win the global technology race in the semiconductor industry. Ongoing support from the CHIPS Act with its Section 48D Advanced Manufacturing Tax Credit will enable companies like OnSemi to continue to invest in the U.S., 
compete with companies that are located offshore, and strengthen the resiliency of cr critical supply chains. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your calling for this hearing and this committee's support of the U.S. semiconductor industry. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Ms. Janice, thank you very much, and good to hear uh, about chips manufacturing going on in Gresham, Oregon. That's, that's the right place to have it. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Silver. Good morning, Chairman Whiting, Wyden, Ranking Member Crapo, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for holding today's important hearing on how the U.S. tax code impacts manufacturing in America. My name is Courtney Silver, and I am the president and owner of Ketchy. Following my husband's passing, I was honored to take over Ketchy, a third-generation, full-service precision machine shop located in Concord, North Carolina. Ketchy was established in 1947 to fill the gap of the local textile industry after World War II. We have been a pillar in Concord for nearly 80 years, providing strong manufacturing jobs and giving back to our community. Our mission is to support U.S. manufacturing supply chain by delivering reliable, high-quality machine parts to our customers. We invest in equipment, technology, and most importantly, people to make it easy for our customers to focus on what they do best and have confidence in their manufacturing supply chain. My testimony will focus around one main theme today, and I hope if members take away anything from me, it is this. Manufacturing is a team sport. A team can only reach greatness if every player is operating at their full potential. If not, the team falls apart. At the core of any sport are clear, sensible rules that do not unfairly handicap any players. The rules must be consistent, rather than constantly changing, so that the game does not devolve into chaos. In this context, the rules of the game are the U.S. tax code. The 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was revolutionary for the manufacturing sector. After it was signed into law, Ketchy experienced its best year in our seven-decade history. I know others further up in my supply chain were booming as well. I clearly remember our typically organized shop floor covered in pallets of material in every available space to keep up with our customers' demands. We were able to invest more than $1 million in capital equipment and create several new jobs within Ketchy in 2018. While Ketchy experienced a significant increase in sales, every day is a battle. When you want to win, the only choice is to pour profits back into your team. We made major investments in capital equipment. We were able to purchase advanced robotics. We invested in new HVAC systems for our facilities and new security and safety systems for our team members. What I am most proud of is that we were able to provide 100% of our catchy team with pay raises and quarterly bonuses in the years following TCJA. Our team members were buying their families' first homes and first cars. We were making a true difference in the lives of those who had dedicated themselves to our mission. Of course, our growth tra trajectory was disrupted during the COVID-19 pandemic like the rest of the world. However, thanks to TCJ's impact in 2018 and 2019, we were able to withstand the shutdowns and supply disruptions in 2020. Even as some of our customers went out of business and others were unable to pay open invoices, we were able to survive. Ketchy might not be here today if we did not have the economic boom by tax reform in the years prior to the pandemic. Unfortunately, beginning in 2022, the rules of the game began to change, making it more difficult for manufacturers to thrive in America. Crucial policies began to expire, such as immediate R&D expensing, enhanced interest deductibility, and full expensing. These tax policies were a game changer for the manufacturing industry. They certainly were for Ketchy. Manufacturers need members of this committee to restore these policies and ensure small manufacturers can compete here and in the global economy. And more tax increases are on the way. 
Other critical provisions expire at the end of 2025, which will have a direct impact on the manufacturing sector. Ketchy will be directly harmed by the loss of the pass-through deduction, the increase in our tax rates, the reduced prote protection from the estate tax. If Congress does not act both now and in 2025, manufacturers will be competing with one hand tied behind our back for the foreseeable future. Manufacturers across the country made a promise to take tax reform's pro-growth provisions and ensure they had a direct positive impact on American lives. We have kept our promise, and I hope Congress will allow us con to continue to do so even more. Manufacturing truly is a team sport, and you all are on our team. Small companies like mine are depending upon you to play with us rather than against us, and to ensure our U.S. tax code does the same. Thank you. Well said. We're going to be playing with you very hard over the next few weeks to get done what we can get done now, and then we'll have a big debate in 2025. Thank you. Mr. Huntsman, again, welcome, and We'll talk mental health another time. Thank you very much, Chairman Wyden. And I know my father greatly appreciated his work with you, particularly his friendship with you. Uh, Ranking Member Crapo, members of the committee, my name is Peter Huntsman. I'm Chairman, President, Chief Executive Officer of Huntsman Corporation. Over 40 years ago, I worked as a Senate intern for Orrin Hatch. The idea that I'm testifying before his former committee is nearly inconceivable to me. If there is one conclusion I'd like members of this committee to come away with from my testimony is this. American manufacturing dominance, prosperity, security, and power are based predominantly on access to cheap, abundant, and reliable energy, primarily in the form of hydrocarbons. Without it, our way of life is simply not possible. My father started his life in an Idaho home with no indoor plumbing. He founded Huntsman and built a global chemical company with billions in revenues, operations in dozens of countries, and thousands of associates. He is a quintessential American story. I started my career as a truck driver. Over my life, I've witnessed boom and bust business cycles, multiple uh, iterations of peak oil and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the reunification of Europe, the rise of China, the birth of the Internet, the transformational impact of hydraulic fracturing, among other things. I've also observed the tax policy and regulatory environment around the chemical sector as it has ebbed and flowed across Democratic and Republican administrations and Congresses. Our company and the chemical industry has played a role in it all. In the chemical industry, we take atoms and molecules, we break them apart and put them back together to make the building blocks of virtually everything you see and touch in modern life automobiles and trucks, airplanes, mineral refining, batteries, building and insulation materials, pharmaceuticals, semiconductors and computers, solar panels, wind turbines, clean drinking water, to just name a few. The most utilized starting atoms are from chemical, for the chemical manufacturing, from atoms and hydrocarbons derived from natural gas and petroleum. Without abundant access to these fossil fuel feedstocks, we cannot make chemicals. One of the biggest threats to American manufacturing is the belief that we can choose not to extract our natural resources. Even if we could transition tomorrow to a fossil fuel free energy grid, we cannot transition away from fossil fuels as a feedstock for chemical and manufacturing production. It is a chemical sector that develops the molecules that allow us to lower our emissions. If the goal of government and business is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, tax policy should be calibrated to increase production of the very chemicals and materials needed to reduce energy consumption. MDI, made by Huntsman, is a great example of this. MDI is used to make spray foam insulation. This building material reduces energy consumption by as much as 50%. Huntsman was pleased to work with Senators Hassan and Collins on legislation that updated the Energy Efficient Home Improvement Tax Credit to be sure we capture the energy conservation benefits of spray foam. Increased adoption of EVs in the United States 
will increase our nation's dependence on China unless the U.S. government enables a massive domestic expansion of mining and chemical refining. For most parts of the EV battery supply chain, China is the dominant global producer. American companies have little hope of competing against lower-cost Chinese labor, Chinese coal-based manufacturing, and Chinese pricing. Huntsman has experienced this phenomenon firsthand. Huntsman is the only North American producer of ethylene carbonate, a chemical that is so critical to the production of electrolytes that you cannot make an EV battery without it. In 2021, Huntsman made the decision to invest $50 million to increase our U.S. production capacity by 530% to meet the projected needs of the U.S. EV battery business. However, following passage of the IRA, Chinese producers slashed their price for EC, ethylene carbonate, by 75%, a level far below Huntsman's cost of production. Huntsman simply cannot compete with, Hunts with Chinese under these circumstances, and I recently made the painful decision to suspend work on this expansion. Reductions in energy consumption, a robust manufacturing industry, and secure supply chains in the U.S. can be achieved only if America has a thriving chemical industry. America needs policies that recognize and promote our industry. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Huntsman. And all of you, you've been very helpful. And I'm going to start with, uh, with taxes. Now, the tax bill that's being considered is a bill that was written by the House Republican Chair of the Ways and Means Committee, Jason Smith, and myself. So this smith wyden bill uh, had a number of key provisions, helping 16 million kids trying to figure out how they were going to get shoes and school clothes and all that kind of thing. And then it was going to be paired with the important business incentives. And it right at the center of that was the research and development tax break. And it was the feeling of members that to compete with China, <clears throat> who gives such generous incentives for research and development, we couldn't walk away from research ourselves. But that was what was done in the Republican tax bill in 2017. That research and development incentive was stripped. And ever since then, I can tell our panel, I have heard virtually every senator and most members of Congress, whether they were Democrats and Republicans, say, I'm going to get that fixed at the first possible opportunity. That first possible opportunity has now arrived. 357 members of the House of Representatives have voted for that. 16 million kids getting help, important uh, assistance for housing, and we're pulling out all the stops to get that done there, yet here. So my question to our witnesses today, you really sort of started it, Ms. Silver, is <clears throat> what the effect of postponing this tax bill would mean for all of you. Mr. Widmer, what uh, kind of damage would be done to domestic manufacturers if the Senate punts on the passage of the provisions in the smith wyden tax bill? Yeah, first and foremost, we, we're uh, somewhat on an island on our own. We're a U.S. company that has to go up against China, Inc. All of our competition is outside of the U.S. and, and headquartered in China. Um, we need to out-innovate. So the only way we're going to be successful is by being a technology leader. Um, we're in the process right now of making a $400 million investment in a research and development center uh, in, in Ohio. Uh, we'll be spending about 200 to $250 million a year on R&D. If we're not able to out-innovate, right, we will not be able to survive the onslaught that we're facing today. This bill is critical from that standpoint as it relates to R&D uh, and the opportunity to expensing the R&D versus deferring R&D. Plus, it's also very critical to the bonus depreciation that's enabling a lot of the factory expansions that we're making right now. So outside of the R&D centers, we're putting another two plus million dollars into new factories here in the U.S. So this bill is critical that this gets addressed. And, and putting everything off just generates more uncertainty and delay. Delay and loss of thousands of jobs. 
thousands of jobs, thousands of jobs being on the line with getting this done now. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Finley. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the work that you've done to negotiate that. Uh, the, the ability of manufacturers to innovate as, as Mr. Widmer said, has, is so important to global competitiveness. And our fear is that without appropriate tax incentives to do that, companies will stand still for too long. And, and, and that harms uh, their global competitiveness. I also just want to mention the importance of the child tax credit for working families. This is a really critical piece of this legislation. Um, our union would, would support a bolstering to, to what was included in the, in the American Rescue Plan. Um, but we, we do strongly encourage the Senate to begin debate on this. You're absolutely right. And <clears throat> Chairman Smith, to his credit, as we worked in a bipartisan way, a Republican and a Democrat, also made the point that having those opportunities for the kids puts them in a better position to be healthy and become the workers that you're all talking about here today. So there really is a link between healthy kids and a healthy uh, job base. Ms. Janice. Um, right now, the OCD says that the U.S. now ranks 30 out of 37 for research and development incentives among the advanced world economies. If the R&D tax deduction is not restored quickly, R&D will shift to elsewhere in Europe, Asia, and even the other US MCA nations. I recognize that budgets are tight. However, restoration of this immediate expensing is imperative to innovation. I would encourage the committee to um, advance this legislation, the 174 immediate expensing. And if I may also request to um, go for its permanency in order to pro provide a surety to businesses and stabilization. That may be too logical for everybody in Congress right now, but I'm glad to hear that's the voice of Oregon. Thank you and well said. Ms. Silver. Not taking action now has a huge impact on Ketchy and the entire manufacturing sector. In fact, uh, I'm delaying a investment in uh, capital equipment and technology because of it. And it means less job creation. Uh, it Tell me a little bit about the project you're delaying on right now with the uncertainty. Sure. Well, due to uh, the change in bonus depreciation uh, dropping to 60%, uh, it's actually something I think about every day when I walk on my shop floor. I have a very large uh, area on my shop floor that is empty. Uh, and it ha I have a crane there. I have air. I have electrical. I know uh, the piece of machining technology that I would like to invest in. This piece of machining equipment and technology would... It would decrease our lead times. It would increase our productivity. It would get us into new markets that we're not currently in. Uh, and it would create jobs, highly skilled, highly paid jobs in machining. Um, so due to the bonus depreciation dropping to 60%, that changes my return on investment calculation. And it, it feels like an irresponsible business decision and it feels too risky. And it, it's honestly an awful feeling. Uh, it's a roadblock to achieving our mission. My customers are large manufacturers all across our country, and they need to have confidence in their domestic supply chain uh, so they can focus on what they do best. And in order for them to, to have that, I have to be able to invest in machines. I have to be able to invest in our people and invest in processes. Mr. Huntsman, and I'm over my time. Chair Chairman Wyden, I will not repeat what has already been said here. I would just note the company spends roughly $150 million a year. We do not invest one year at a time. We invest over a horizon of 20, 30 years at a time when we build facilities. So what Ms. Janice said earlier about making this permanent would be incredibly helpful. It would also be very helpful if the government and the regulatory body, particularly around the EPA, this Senate worked very hard to pass TSCA which gives the EPA 90 days to approve all the work that comes out of our R&D facilities. We're now waiting in some cases up to three to four years to have our technical innovation and the progress that we make in chemistry to be approved so that we can manufacture. So it'd be great if we get it permanent. It'd be great if the regulatory bodies could also uh, be supporting us as well. All right, Senator Crapo. 
Thank you very much. And, and let me at the outset say uh, uh, I agree completely with, in fact, I don't know that there's a stronger advocate in Congress for extending and making permanent the three expired or expiring TCJA provisions that have been referred to here, the R&D tax credit, the bonus depreciation, and the interest deduction. Uh, my hope is that we can get there sooner than later. Uh, there are, as everybody knows, some concerns on the Republican Senate side with regard to other provisions in the bill. And my hope is that the Republican Senate can have its voice. We will be able to deal with it and get something resolved quickly. Uh, it's a difficult time, and as almost every single issue in this Congress today, there are difficult battles to deal with. That being said, uh, I don't disagree with the testimony of any one of you on, in fact, you are all giving great examples of why those three provisions of the TCJA are so critical. Uh, I would like to go to you first with my question, Mr. Huntsman. I understand, as the example you gave, of, of uh, your need in your company to de delay the opening of a new chemical facility because of how the IRA is being implemented. And tell me if I've got this right. Uh, I, I understand that you were basically undercut by a Chinese price fixing, if you will, by the Chinese market in your effort to develop this new chemical whose name I can't repeat right now. Uh, and that, uh, that the ability of the Chinese to simply Un underbid you in the market caused you to have to stop the production. Is that a, a very first grade level of explaining what happened? Uh, yes. Well, this, this product, ethylene carbonate, is one of the raw materials on a chain. It's, it's, it, look, there are a lot of positive things in the RA, obviously, that, that came out. One of the areas of concern with us, the Treasury Department recently came out and said that a number of the products that China produces will be exempt when we talk about things that are made in America. And I think if you want to write down this this row right here, we would all agree that when it says made in America, that ought to be the entire supply chain too. It yeah. ought not just be a bunch of products that come in from around the world, the final assembly is made in America, but that entire supply chain is made in America. And with a product like ethylene carbonate, uh, that was a product that we were hoping would the Treasury Department would define that and look at that as a product that should be made in America uh, when there are other products like graphite and so forth. We don't make any of that in the, in the United States, but we need to build those industries. We need to give incentives. So this is the product that we hope we, the, the Treasury Department, uh, hopefully in, in due course, will will see fit that we ought to have this as a domestic component. And when the Chinese undercut prices like this, this is usually just in a temporary basis. Sure. This discouraged hundreds of millions of dollars of future investment, not just by Huntsman, but other producers as well, uh, for other companies to come in and eventually produce these products. So thank you. You've explained it very well, but I want to be sure that, that we make this point. The solution to stopping your particular crisis with the Chinese undercutting your prices could be fixed regulatorily by the United States Treasury Department in its regulatory actions. Is, am I correct? That is, yes, sir. So this is a situation in which our interpretation of or our implementation of the IRA has not been effective enough to get us to the point where our American producers can have a balanced playing field against the Chinese. As it pertains to this product, yes, sir. Yes. And I assume that there are a lot of other products that are on that same list that would like to be getting into the designation of being an American-made product. Assuming that we're allowed to produce those products on a competitive playing field, yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Senator Langford, you're next. Chairman, thank you. Thanks for the hearing and pulling this topic together. Y'all, thanks for the testimony as well and to be able to bring these things together. We do need to get permanency in the tax code. Uh, what we're discussing uh, currently right now is a temporary fix, but we need to get some permanency uh, to our tax code so it, it is predictable. I heard multiple of you to say, basically, get the tax code set and leave it alone. Uh, make it business friendly so we can actually hire people, buy equipment, do those things, and to be able to set it. I have the Align Act that deals with the bonus of depreciation to try to make this permanent, and so it is predictable. Uh, this has been bipartisan in the past. 
Uh, every year since 2000, we've had some kind of bonus depreciation, except for 2007. Uh, this hasn't been a partisan issue for us. It's a basic pro-growth uh, policy on our tax policy. I'd like to be able to get it, get it set and to be able to leave it there. Ms. Silver, you, you mentioned a lot about this bonus depreciation piece and some of the investment, obviously a big gap uh, in your shop floor right now waiting on a piece of equipment to be able to come. <clears throat> Talk about the difference between if we, 60% uh, now, as you mentioned before, but just scratch that. If we just set it and just leave it alone, obviously north of 60%, because that's not the tax piece that you need at this point. What is it on the permanency that makes a difference? Because there is some conversation to say the bonus depreciation should just come in in times of economic downturn and not be normal standard policy. Should this just be set in permanent, or is it better when it's just in an economic downturn to turn it on and off? Definitely permanent. Uh, planning, uh, taking risks, innovating, uh, wanting to be here for the next 80 years requires a permanent, stable, consistent, um, common sense tax code. Great. It's what we all expected to be able to hear, but it's where I think we need to head. And obviously next year, as we sit down and talk through a lot of the tax issues as well, we've got to find a way to be able to move this from over the next two years, it has this, to as far as the eye can see to be able to get this set so that we know what policy we're actually going towards and where we're headed on this. Some of the challenges that we've had has been on hydrocarbons, Mr. Huntsman, as you brought up as well. Uh, it is remarkable for me to be able to sit in this room at times and to be able to hear a conversation about ending drilling or ending hyd hydrocarbons, and I sit in this room and think, the carpet's made of hydrocarbons. That little sign right there is made of hydrocarbons. This is made of hydrocarbons. This bottle is made of hydrocarbons. And the belief at some point we're going to just turn all that off and that's going to work out well for our economy is just factually not true based on what's happening both in chemical production and in energy production, trying to keep the cost down. What we've seen is a rise in cost in hydrocarbons right now that is unnecessary in some ways. And the IRA, when it came out, specifically targeted oil and gas production to be able to target them to raise their taxes significantly. Every one of you can deduct your everyday expenses. Every one of you can deduct your everyday expenses unless you're an oil and gas producer. And now you can't do that anymore. So that particular type of manufacturing was pulled out and punished in the tax code in the IRA. And the result that we've seen is higher prices now for oil and gas. It means higher prices for manufacturing, higher prices for the consumers. So the challenge that we have is how to be able to actually protect those mid-sized businesses as well that they don't have to deal with higher tax burdens as well. The Protecting Domestic Energy Act is an act that I have on this. I have a letter. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to be able to enter this into the record. Uh, this, this comes in from uh, the uh, American Exploration Production Council and Domestic Energy Production Alliance, what we know affectionately as AXPC and DEPA. Those organizations saying, hey, we need to find some way to be able to not just deal with tax code for this manufacturer, but all manufacturers actually have fairness in the tax code as well, that they're not specifically targeted. So my question on this is, when we start dealing with the issue of hydrocarbons and start to deal with all of the, the challenges that you have dealing with China and what um, Senator Crapo was saying as well, all the issues about anti-dumping, and I want to drill down a little bit on that with you, Mr. Huntsman. How difficult is it to make a charge on dumping on a trade charge as far as the legal fees, the challenges of it to say, not only my own treasury is, not, is allowing an exception for a Chinese company, which drives a manu American manufacturing out, but if you want to make an anti-dumping charge on China, how technically difficult is that? And is that something this committee, who also has a responsibility for trade, needs to take on? In the uh, 30 years I've been president of this company, I, I don't think we've ever initiated an anti-dumping charge, not because it doesn't occur, it is just too long, too complicated, and you rarely ever see it through to fruition. Uh, it would be it'd be great if somehow we could just streamline that process and, and come to a conclusion quicker. We're not asking that justice be more our side or anybody else's side. Just let's just do it where you can come to a conclusion quicker. Yeah, I've heard that over and over again in steel, for instance, and all kinds of manufacturing to say, we know the dumping is happening, but it's too complicated, too expensive, takes too long to be able to do it. So we just shut down manufacturing 
rather than actually charge to anti-dumping and the American consumer and American businesses and jobs continue to get hurt. Mr. Chairman, I know this is a tax conversation, but this issue I, on trade is exceptionally you, important you, for this committee to take you, on as you well. You got me at hello on the whole issue of streamlining the dumping rules because we hear this in sector after sector. Yeah. So message sent. All right, let's see. Senator Casey, you're here by your lonesome. We're glad you're here, Mr. Manufacturing. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thanks very much, and thanks for calling this hearing. I want to thank you and the ranking member. I want to thank our witnesses for being here. I'll direct my questions probably to only two of our witnesses, but I wanted to start with um, the recent record. It's really a remarkable record of job creation, especially manufacturing job creation. The years 2021, 2022, and 2023 each had more job growth than any year since the 1990s. According to the Federal Reserve, private companies are currently investing a record $225 billion to build and, and refit new manufacturing plants. That's three times the manufacturing investment we saw before the pandemic. So that's why we're, we're glad to be with um, the manufacturers in front of us here, as well as uh, the steel workers. Um, to talk about um, what you're investing in America and also expanding America's productive capacity. Mr. Winmar, I'll start with you. You testified about First Solar's, quote, unique, uh, uniquely domestic supply chain, unquote. Can you tell us what are the advantages of having an American supply chain? Yeah, it's, for me, it, it all comes back down to certainty and uh, integrity of your counterparties uh, to deliver against obligations and commitments. And we're making investments um, that are multi-year uh, investments that go out really towards the end of this decade. Uh, and I need to have counterparties and partners who can grow and can scale with me that I know are going to be there at the time that I start to ramp a new factory. Um, my supply chain is just instrumental to the success of our company long term. Um, trying to have a supply chain for manufacturing operations in the U.S. that are offshore or in Southeast Asia or even China just opens you up to too much risk and exposure. Um, and we saw that through the, the pandemic and the disruption in ocean freight, uh, cost associated with it, and we've seen it more recently with what's going on in, in the Red Sea. Um, I make a product that comes off a production line in about every one second somewhere in the world, most of that being here in the U.S. I produce 24-7, um, 365. I need a supply chain that can be there with me to grow. If, if I'm not, if my glass supplier doesn't meet their delivery commitment, I can't run my factory. If my junction box supplier doesn't meet their commitment, I can't run my factory. So having a supply chain that's close, that we can rely on, have certainty around, has been instrumental to our long-term success. And it translates into the success in our relationship with our customers. And we have a very unique approach um, compared to our competition, which we refer to as responsible solar. Um, we have a circular economy approach to what we do. We recycle everything uh, that we make. Over 90 plus percent of the content is recycled and reused. And having supply chain partners that can work with you to evolve your value proposition into the marketplace has been very important for us. And we've been very successful with selling out multiple years of demand right now. Well, that's good news. And I, I think a lot of what you said is what we're, we're contemplating when we're putting together the Inflation Reduction Act. In that legislation, I sponsored a domestic content bonus tax credit, which rewards companies who have American supply chains. That is meaning that they manufacture their product in America with American materials and American workers from start to finish. In fact, First Solar will be buying, I'm told, $2.6 billion worth of high-tech glass from Pennsylvania manufacturers, a manufacturer in that has locations in both Meadville and Carlisle, and I wanted to ask you, to ask you if, if um, the um, or if you can tell me about the effect that my domestic content bonus credit had on your business and your suppliers in Pennsylvania. So, so right now with the current guidelines that are out on domestic content. Um, we started a journey in about 2019, 2018 to localize our supply chain. Uh, timing was obviously very good given how things have moved forward, but it was a strategic thread along the lines that I referenced before on why we wanted a domestic supply chain. Um, in today's market right now, we are the only 
um, under the current guidelines that qualifies to have a domestic product here in the U.S. Uh, all of the components that are required in order to meet the requirements for domestic content are sourced in the U.S. and are manufactured here in the U.S. So it translates directly into our uh, ability to sell through uh, to our end customers, to give them world's leading best technology, and, and for us to then to contract have uh, multi-year uh, investments and contracts that go out now through 2028 and 2029. That's great. Mr. Chairman, thanks. I'll have a question for the record for Ms. Fenley, but thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, and, uh, and thank you in particular, Senator Casey, for all your contributions in the IRA, because I know that was a difficult uh, and challenging issue for many of your communities, and I think we, we're getting it right. Those are communities I have in timber and natural resources, so I'm glad to be aligned with you on that, and thank you for your work. Okay, Senator Blackburn, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the hearing on this. Um, I want to talk a bit about competitiveness, and as we've gone through the hearing this morning, you've heard a little bit uh, about that. It's... It, when I talk to Tennessee companies, this is what they talk with me about, whether it's com competitive domestically, competitive in a global market. Uh, they talk about the inputs and the cost of those inputs, uh, the importance of tax and tariffs and how that plays into their pricing and, therefore, their competitiveness. And um, let's go to Ms. Silver and Mr. Huntsman. And Ms. Silver first and then Mr. Huntsman, because I, I do want to talk about the Tax Cut and Job Act, because that, um, when I talk to Tennesseans, they talk about how they benefited from that. And cutting that tax rate from 35 to 21 percent and basically saying to businesses, this is a good place to invest and to grow your business. And then we hear the president yesterday talk about hiking that corporate tax rate to 28 and then increasing the book minimum tax from 15 to 21 percent, which, as you can imagine, I heard immediately from some of our manufacturers. So uh, Ms. Silver first and then Mr. Huntsman, talk to me about how the TCJA helped you to grow your business, how it influences the decisions that you make, and what would be the consequences for raising that tax rate? Ms. Silver first. Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, so TCGA provisions were, and they were rocket fuel for us. They, um, we were able to invest in over a million dollars in capital equipment, create jobs, uh, give our team members quarterly bonuses, raises. Um, there was, it, it gave us confidence, uh, and, and not only confidence, but it gave us cash flow. It gave us liquidity. Oh, okay. Um, which was especially proved to be critical going into the unexpected years uh, of, the, of the pandemic. And a, a quick example of even just some of these tax provisions that you mentioned, um, because of those TCJ tax provisions, we were able to, a couple of years ago, invest in uh, our first collaborative robot. And so this robot allows us to run a machine uh, during the day and after shift uh, with no one there. And so it decreases our lead time, it increases our productivity, so much so that I was able to uh, increase or pass along um, a cost savings. I was able to reduce my customer's price on, on these particular uh, precision machine parts. And this customer is a large customer in the fluid motion control industry. So we were able to invest in our company due to good pro-growth tax policies, our, pass along these savings to our customer, they're able to reduce their cost of goods sold, and then I still am making a very healthy profit. So this is, it's a win-win okay. uh, for the entire manufacturing supply chain. Great. Mr. Huntsman. Yes, thank you very much. We were uh, able to bring back over a billion dollars from offshore businesses back into the United States. Of that, 
At least half of that went into uh, projects over the course of the last five years, uh, capital projects to expand production, uh, to uh, bring manufacturing uh, into the, the domestic uh, markets here. And uh, for us, that, that's, that's been it also, it's bolstered our R&D. We've been able to develop new technologies in the field of chemistry to reduce waste, better recyclability and so forth. So as we look at that entire supply chain for us, uh, it's, it's, it's made uh, the United States now one of the most competitive areas uh, in which we can invest. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank my colleague. Senator Warren is next. And um, let me see, Senator Warren, Senator Barrasso was here first. So um, Senator Barrasso is next, then Senator Warren. And uh, colleagues ought to know that uh, we're getting ready to wrap up. Senator Brasso. Th thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Huntsman, good, good to see you again and uh, good to be with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for pulling these folks together. You know, conventional energy is at the heart of U.S. manufacturing. Uh, petrochemicals derived from oil and natural gas help our nation manufacture thousands of the everyday products and the high-tech devices that people use every day. These include plastics, clothing, digital devices, medical equipment, pharmaceuticals, detergents, tires, fertilizers to grow our food. So ironically, solar panels and wind turbines rely heavily on oil and gas production. Uh, President Biden and many Democrat uh, colleagues uh, in the Senate want to move us away from these resources. Um, they use the tax code as both a carrot and a stick to make that happen. Uh, they throw up regulatory roadblocks to stifle traditional energy production and refining. And you mentioned this in your testimony, but I just don't think we can hear it enough right now. What would it mean for U.S. manufacturing if we continue to move away from oil, gas, coal production, and is manufacturing even possible without the production of those fossil fuels? Thank you very much, Senator Brasso. It's very nice to see you as well. Look, I have no problem moving away from fossil fuels so long as you can move me to something else. And the problem is there simply is no replacement, as I said in my uh, prepared remarks. Even if you were to go to a complete fossil-free energy grid system, if we were to go to 100% nuclear, you would still need the, these build, basic building blocks to produce all the products that you've just said. And when we talk about one of the greatest inflationary pressures on society, particularly for those of low income, it is, it is the inflation that we see in these basic raw materials. We simply pass these through. I, I shouldn't say simply because you have to have, we're still having to compete against foreign entities and so forth. But the, these, these higher costs, whether it's in taxation or whether it's in raw materials, uh, these are just pass-throughs that go on down and, and they, they put the inflationary pressures as we saw this morning's numbers. Uh, the, these, are, these are stubborn things that turn around. Sure. Energy prices are up, but certainly food, groceries. I mean, the thing I hear about in Wyoming is the cost of going to the grocery store, and it's much, much higher now than it was three years ago when this administration took over. Well, your cost of manufacturing uh, food, uh, protecting food, cold storage of food, packaging of food, transportation of food, all of this, that, that all supplies, that's, that's all part of our supply chain that we, 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 that we produce and supply. Yeah. I would get to China if I, if I could. As, as we find opportunities to grow U.S. manufacture, I think we have to look at a ways to limit China's influence in the United States in terms of manufacturing and the impact on supply chains. You know, this so-called Inflation Reduction Act, uh, with the help of the administration, I think it further opened the door for U.S. tax dollars to go to entities controlled by China. Our energy and green manufacturing sectors are flooded with expensive tax credits, and this uh, tax and spending bill is pushing us away from the fuels and the technologies that, um, that America dominates. Instead of pushing us toward the minerals and technologies controlled by China, I think we ought to be focusing more on what we ought to do here in the United States. So uh, American Made is the title of this hearing, but the products and the technologies that the Democrats are subsidizing are going to be put in ways with uh, components and materials that say on them made in China. So my question to you is, what are some ways that China benefits from this so-called Inflation Reduction Act, and isn't that hurting us? 
Well, many, many of the products that go into the supply chain of the battery components and so forth uh, are exempt or, or say, we don't have to say that they're made in China. We can just say, well, we don't produce them here and they're gonna be part of that. So you look at the Ford's recent earnings and I don't have the exact numbers on this, but I think they lose somewhere between 50 and $60,000 per car, per EV that they produce. I can assure you that China does not lose money on the battery components that they are selling into that EV everything from the cadmium to the lithium to the cobalt and so forth, manganese, products that we can be producing here domestically, ethylene carbonates and so forth. Those products are of great profit and they continue to be subsidized by Chinese coal and, and, uh, and, and government subsidies. So th there is that balancing that we either need to, to commit to that production, no supply chains ourselves, incentivize and admit that we need to get in there or we need to let the Chinese do it if we're gonna have an EV fleet. Yeah, and, and from what I've read in terms of the economists, where most people in, you know, for most traditional vehicles, you ask the average person, what percentage of the entire cost of the vehicle is the battery? For electric vehicles, it's about half of the cost is the battery. Is that consistent with your findings? Well, it certainly is the, the most technically oriented and the part with the fewest raw material suppliers. You don't go out and find 20 different suppliers of cobalt. Usually you've got one or two Chinese producers in these areas. This isn't something you go scour and get in 15 different suppliers around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time's Thank expired. Thank you, Senator Stabenow's next. And I appreciate all my colleagues being patient. We've got people coming and going, and it's a little hectic, and I think we can get everybody. Senator uh, Stabenow's next. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad I got in at the end of this conversation a um, uh, little bit, because it's... Um, uh, it's interesting to me as we transition, as a person who has uh, authored the uh, Made in America uh, office that we now have and the robust incentives for Buy America, we know that we don't yet produce everything here. That's why we're scrambling so hard to be able to get that done. When we passed the CHIPS Act, we didn't say, you can't manufacturers or, or technology companies and so on buy any more chips overseas. You gotta wait five years till we get these fabrication plants up and going in the United States. We didn't say that, we didn't say that. Would have been pretty dumb to say that. And instead what we are doing is building the capacity here so we can bring those jobs home as we continue. Now, the reason this is such a big fight is because it's oil and gas on one side who are frantically trying to sh slow down EVs. And so that's the undercurrent that I see happening all the time on this as we transition to the technology and batteries and other kinds of technology that's needed for electrification on vehicles, and we will get there. And in fact, in the past three years under President Biden, we've made incredible progress in a whole range of clean energy areas. 650, 649 billion, with a B, in new private sector investment announcements across an array of industries, and there's more to come. And we know we've got nearly 15 million new jobs, including 800,000 new manufacturing jobs and counting. We have about 350,000 new jobs in Michigan that we are very excited about. When you make things, you say Michigan. And so we are very excited about that as well. But this couldn't have come at a more important time because we are on the knife's edge of seeding an insurmountable lead to China on advanced manufacturing. We know that, which is why the strategy has been put in place with the infrastructure law and chips and science, and most notably, the Inflation Reduction Act. And that is what is going to allow us to make that transition to own this technology. There's no reason we can't do that. We, we have smart businesses, smart workers, and creating the technology, and we are in a position to retake uh, our position as global leaders. And so uh, when we look at this, I mean, we, we are hearing people talking about uh, domestic manufacturing renaissance, and I think we are, we're starting it. But it's a transition, just like any other transitions to new technology, unfortunately, there are huge, very, very big wealthy forces on the other side that do not want this to happen and will continue to put out what I view as disingenuous and, and many times just plain false information to try to slow this down as much as possible. Uh, 
questions. Uh, one provision that's going to play a particularly important role uh, in putting America in the driver's seat will be the Clean Energy Manufacturing Tax Credit uh, 48C. I first authored this in the 2009 Recovery Act. We've now brought it back and are focused on this. Um, and uh, I think this is going to be an important part of this. I'm, Ms. Fende, I wanted to, first of all, uh, thank you for the United Auto Workers' support for this provision. Uh, you've been very steadfast in supporting this and making things in America and bringing jobs home. So appreciative. As we allocate the decisions for the first round for 48C, Ms. Fende, what sort of impacts do you foresee this credit having in communities across the country? Thank you for the question. Um, and, and we're also very glad that you've brought this credit back. Um, Congress allocated a tremendous amount of money to catalyze investment in manufacturing jobs in communities across the country. I, I think one of the most important things that Congress did is allocate a portion of the funding directly to coal or energy communities where there is potential or already job loss that has happened so that we are reinvesting in those communities through 48C and hopefully through follow-on private investment to, to really rebuild some of those local economies. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and let me ask um, uh, a question on domestic content bonus. Solar is one area where we have a lot of catching up to do in the United States as a global leader. And as it stands right now, Chinese headquartered companies now make up 99% of the world's uh, solar wafer and 80% of the world's polysilicon produ production, two core components that make up half the cost of solar panels. But we also are in a position um, to be able to take that back. So um, I sent a letter along with many colleagues asking Treasury to ensure that solar poly polysilicon and wafer manufacturing are both counted in the IRA's domestic content bonus rules. Mr. Woodmeyer, if you could, I know I'm out of time here, but uh, how important is it that the administration get the implementation of this right as we go forward? I, th I think it's absolutely critical, and I, and I obviously applaud you and, and some of the other senators for proposing uh, the legislation that would actually require the wafer to be included in as part of the definition of domestic content. The intent of, of the IRA, as well as for the domestic content, was to enable a domestic industry, a domestic value chain. You, you have to then evaluate, associate value to those various components and where there's technology differentiation or there's high value added, added manufacturing. Um, to simply allocate uh, domestic content criteria benefits to module assembly does nothing for us. And I think uh, Mr. Huntsman made something, a very similar comment about that earlier on as well. We need to enable cycles of innovation and technology here in the U.S. It is no secret, and it should not surprise anyone here, China does not want the U.S. to have its own domestic capabilities. We not only manufacture here in the U.S., we actually manufacture in other markets internationally, such as India, similar policies that India has put in, and China is trying to disrupt that. That's why there's such a global oversupply right now. They're trying to usurp the opportunities that countries like the U.S. are trying to create with domestic capabilities. We have to avoid that at all costs, and we have to Thank make you. sure that there's value created to the technology and the domestic content has to be associated with that. Thank you. And as I close, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I just want to put in a plug. You already asked about the Wyden Smith t tax bill. The research in there is so important. That The R&D tax credit is so so important to this discussion. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. Senator Carper's next. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for pulling us together. To each of our witnesses, good morning. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts and responding to our, our, uh, our questions. Um, the uh, manufacturing is one of the largest sectors in uh, Delaware's economy. We're tourism, we're big in uh, agriculture, we're big in biopharmaceuticals, uh, but we're also uh, uh, a growing uh, present, a growing presence of manufacturing jobs, which is a good thing. We're a small state, but just I think last uh, couple of years we added uh, about 2,000 new manufacturing jobs, all of them welcome in, and we're excited about that. In Delaware and across our, our country, uh, clean energy has been at the forefront of the manufacturing boom, as you know. Uh, as we know, without the right incentives to help American companies scale their production, Demand for these clean energy technologies will go to the lowest cost producers in China. 
I have a question for uh, Mr. Widmer. I don't, don't, we don't mean to pick on you, but uh, the, uh, uh, you showed up, so we're going to take this opportunity. But uh, could you just explain for us how the Inflation Reduction Act has provided certainty for your business and uh, strengthened domestic supply chains in the solar industry? Yeah, I think this is what's so important about uh, the, the Inflation Reduction Act is that it's the first time it actually gave a view of a runway of certainty around a policy environment that would go out 10 years effectively, right, to early uh, 2030s. It also created an opportunity to enable and create a value to all participants in the industry. Um, so whether you're the developer of a project, whether you're the manufacturer of the technology, whether you're the owner of the generating asset, there was value for everyone that we all could align to. It was the first time there's ever been that type of industry approach and overall alignment that we can now work collectively and collaboratively together for success. So it created a long-term vision, it created the alignment, and then it enabled the investments that needed to be made. So if, if you think about it, one of the key opportunities on policy has to be um, around industrial policy, which the IRA did. It gave us a very strong industrial policy and it gave us a very strong demand profile. So the investment tax credit, is an, or excuse me, the manufacturing tax credit was very uh, enabling of an industrial policy and a production tax credit with bonus adders for domestic content and alike addressed the demand side of the equation, which were two fundamental uh, enablers of, an, of a policy environment that people could move forward to. And then we've added, you know, we've, a lot of new capacity has come into the U.S. Uh, us personally have doubled our manufacturing uh, here in the U.S. because of the IRA. We have a, a local supply chain, so 100% of our materials are sourced locally, so we actually then enabled our suppliers to, in terms of their growth. And as we indicated in, in our um, prepared remarks, if you go through and you look at the economic impact of what we as one company are doing as a result of IRA is creating 30,000 direct, indirect, and induced jobs here in the U.S., that'll be about $2.8 billion of annual payroll. I don't know of any other policy that can have that direct of an impact around U.S. manufacturing innovation and jobs. Good. Thanks for, for those comments. As, as we know, there are uh, a lot of factors that uh, determine whether or not businesses are, are, are going to be successful or, or not. One of the things that's most important is certainty and predictability. And uh, I'm reminded of that uh, almost every day in the work that we do here. Over, um, I think, the last 15 or so years, uh, Delaware has positioned itself as a leader in our country's hydrogen and fuel cell manufacturing economy. We're not alone in that regard. In order to sustain uh, this growing industry, uh, we need to extend the traditional fuel cell investment tax credit until green hydrogen is available at scale. And I've introduced uh, bipartisan bicameral legislation to do just that, and I want to uh, thank and express my appreciation to our fellow committee member, Senator Brown, Senator Tellis, for joining me and my lead uh, sponsor, uh, Senator uh, Lindsey Graham. And uh, we look forward to continuing working with Chairman Wyden. We look forward to committing, working with uh, Ranking Member Senator Crapo and the rest of our colleagues to find a pass forward to extend this critical tax credit. And with that, uh, thank you. I bid you adieu. I, I thank my colleague. Senator Tillis is next. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I thought it was Senator Johnson. Um, That's what I thought, too. You know something? You are right. Senator Johnson is next. Well, let me thank my colleagues. For, no, no. For, you're all clustered in the line. Senator Johnson, you are up. My apologies. Okay. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I just came from a budget hearing where the President's presenting a $7.3 trillion a year budget. Uh, this is uh, $3 trillion more than the $4.4 trillion we spent in 2019. Uh, astounding. There's not one year, projecting out 10 years, where the deficit is less than $1.5 trillion. Um, so we're, we're talking about a tax code. And a quick question for, for all the witnesses, just quick yes or no. Do you think our current tax code is simple and rational? Mr. Widmar. That's a dangerous question, but I will say no. Uh, Ms. Fenley. Uh, I'd agree it's challenging. <laughs> Ms. Janice. I'd have to agree it's, it's extremely complex. Ms. Silver. No. Ms. Transman. No. So I ran a manufacturing plant for 30 years. So I've made investment decisions and invested in millions of dollars in plant and equipment. And from my standpoint, the thing that was most annoying, other than regulation, over-regulation, was the complexity of the tax code. 
I, I never based an investment decision based on tax treatment, quite honestly. I mean, when you get right down in the nubs, I suppose you can you know, take a look at the, the ROI and uh, determine, well, if I get this deduction now, it's, it's going to put me over that limit. But generally, I was responding to supply and demand and looking ahead. Um, I also, as, as a student, I was an accountant, uh, took, got an accounting degree, and I remember a tax course where one of the tax principles was wherewithal to pay. So I guess what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make in, in this questioning is, you know, rather than arguing over, you know, the, these different treatments to economically engineer through the tax code, and I think we do a terrible job of it because it comes and goes, it does, it creates a high level of uncertainty. What, what I am proposing is why don't we rather than reform our tax code, all change is not progress, all movement is not forward, why aren't we talking about simplifying and rationalizing it? Wouldn't would that be a better way to approach this thing is, is take a look at this and go, what's a simple way of taxing American business? Um, I would suggest a really simple way would be to consider cash income, taxable income. Then you wouldn't have all these issues of R&D tax credit, accelerated depreciation. And by the way, it would just be a timing difference, correct? M Mr. Huntsman, you, uh, you obviously operate in a global scale. Uh, don't you think that'd be a rational approach here? Simplify the tax code. Let's tax cash income and get rid of all this crap. I just like your comment on it. It, it, it. You're getting me kind of just a little bit off kilter here. I, it sounds it sounds reasonable. Yes, it does. Oh, it's very reasonable. Okay, I, so, I, so, so, without, it's also, very, it's also studied, very doable without yeah, having but, studied it. Yes, yes but sir. we don't do it because all of a sudden you don't have lobbyists coming here every year and having to lobby for this tax treatment or the other tax treatment. You know, I, I think it's remarkable. And again, I was, not a, I was not a real big fan of the Tax Act in 2017, 2018. I had to dig my heels in because all we were going to do is cut income taxes for the top 5% C-Corps. You know, great for the C-Corps, really bad for pastors who have to compete with them. So I, I dug my heels in, in, in the end, voted for it. But what's not widely known is, because we didn't know it at the time, what the effective tax rate of C-Corps were in 2017-2018 was 21% for, for both large and small C-Corps. Now, after the, the Tax Act, large corporations, the effective rate is 10%. For small corporations, C-Corps, it's 14%. So in that act, we actually created disparity between large corporations and small corporations. I don't like that fact. Plus, with the pass-through provisions expiring in 2026, now we're going to have an enormous disparity between the top 5% C-Corp versus the other 95% of businesses. So I guess my appeal to this committee is, let's take a look at what we need to do in 2026. Let's simplify and rationalize our tax code. You know, income is income. You need wherewithal to pay. So let's just tax cash income. And then we don't have to worry about all these provisions. We, we won't have all these lobbyists coming in here, you know, begging for continuation and totally screwing up their business models. Again, I completely agree with the fact that all these things are temporary. It's very hard to make business decisions if you don't know what your tax treatment is going to be. So th that's basically my pitch. I'd like all of you to consider it. And I certainly would like the chairman, the ranking member, to consider what I've been proposing. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Bennett, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the panel for being here, and thank you for holding this, this hearing. I, um, my first question is for Anna Fenley and for Mark Widmer. Um, thank you for being here. Um, with the IRA, we passed the most significant climate legislation that any country on the planet has passed. And because of that bill, the United States is better positioned than any country in the world, I think, to lead the global transition in, in energy. The IRA in, incentives will help us deploy a lot more solar, a lot more wind and battery projects, and help us add uh, three times the amount of clean energy to the grid by 2030. That is all good news from Colorado's perspective. Those incentives were also designed to help us onshore clean 
energy supply chain so we can begin to wean ourselves off products from China and other countries around the world, something the American people want us to do. Last summer, I visited Pueblo, Colorado, which was once the steel capital of the, of the West, and, and, it, and it powered our state, it powered our country for decades. That community is long felt ignored by Washington for good reason. It's felt stymied by our inability to actually invest at home in our own industries. And until now in Pueblo, uh, and, and until now uh, in Pueblo, I visit CS Wind, which is now the world's largest wind tower production facility. The facility is expanding to double its input, and the chairman of CS Wind told us that this this expansion, Mr. Chairman, would not have happened without the tax credits that we passed in the IRA. And as a result, the company will create 50, 850 new jobs in Pueblo, jobs that pay a good wage, a really good wage, and equip workers with the skills for the 21st century economy. Because of the legislation we passed, for the first time in a long time, we are actually outcompeting the rest of the world. We're showing the world what it looks like when America actually invests in America again. So Ms. Finley and, and Mr. Widmer, could you speak a little bit about how these clean energy manufacturing tax credits, not only for wind, but for solar and for batteries, will continue to drive clean energy deployment, create good paying jobs, and spur new investments in communities around the economy? How are these provisions in the IRA helping us to compete with China? You can fight it out. No, I'm just kidding. Please don't. Well, I'll pick up on, on your question about, about China. It's, it's been a conversation by most of the witnesses here today. And I, I think um, China has had a long-term industrial strategy on, on many of these technologies that, that you're talking about. The Inflation Reduction Act, along with the CHIPS bill, along with pieces of the bipartisan infrastructure law, are industrial policy for the U.S. They are, they are providing some long-term um, policies that manufacturers can take some, cert some, some certainty from that will help us build and deploy here in the U.S. and hopefully export to the rest of the world. Yeah, as it relates to, um, to growth and adoption of, of solar, um, it's it's been a significant catalyst. Um, you know, some of them, I was meeting with a handful of customers a week or so ago, um, and one of our uh, key partners is who's developing about 10 gigawatts of, of solar uh, across the U.S. Um, says I have no issue right now with he referred to it as customer acquisition. There's a tremendous amount of demand right now. Um, it's a matter of how to best to serve that, or what are the constraints that we're dealing with right now in order to to address the underlying market demand. Um, there are issues like um, grid capacity or tra transformer certain equipments today is a little bit more challenging in order to um, meet the requirements of, of the build schedules that we're starting to yeah. see. So those are becoming some challenges. So the catalyst of the market is strong. The other challenge I would say is just certainty. There's with the onslaught of the collapse in global pricing for solar modules right now, with the excess supply that China has dumped into the international markets that have been heavily subsidized by um, their domestic industry and then exported into international markets. It's creating some concern right now in, in terms of uh, ability to deliver against the vision that a lot of people have set out to, to, to accomplish. So that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, and and when, with, when you lack certainty, you lack ability to move investments forward through investment committees. Um, and a lack of understanding of announcements that were made here in the U.S. for new manufacturers. You know, First Solar is unique in our technology, right? So our technology is thin film. I don't have the same constraints of the supply chain that my competition does. But we all do one thing. We take photons and we make electrons with a semiconductor that's sitting between two sheets of glass. That's what we do. And the world of electrification cannot happen unless somebody's making photons and changing them into electrons at least enabled through solar. Um, so we need the innovation and the capabilities here in the U.S. market to really aspire to accomplish the vision. We, Thank we, you. We Thank have, you, Mr. We have a vote on, and we're going to Thank try you, and Mr. get Chair. everybody in. Senator Thank Tillis you. is next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be, I'll, uh, be brief. First, I, uh, I want to um, 
uh, welcome everybody uh, here to the committee, but I also have to favor uh, Ms. Silver, who happens to represent a North Carolina manufacturer that's only about 25 minutes from my house. So thank you all for being here. The, uh, I'm glad that we're having a hearing about uh, how tax policy can really improve, um, uh, basically improve economic circumstances for everybody. Um, I think we proved that in 2017 when we passed the Jobs and Tax Cuts Act. Uh, there's no question uh, by any reasonable measure that the economy had an immediate response to it. Uh, in fact, you know, so my, I'm so glad that we did it. Uh, it, it, it was a partisan uh, maneuver uh, made through reconciliation, but thank goodness that the economic activity was where it was before we encountered the pandemic. Can you imagine if our economic activity had been at the rate that it was in 2016? Uh, I think it would have been devastating. And quite honestly, we wouldn't have had the resources or at least the optimism about future resources to commit the trillions of dollars that we did without paying for it. Um, uh, when we were passing those bills. Uh, and we did it solely on the basis of the need to address something that no Congress had had to deal with for 100 years. Um, so, uh, Mr. Ch I, I really appreciate the Chair's leadership. Uh, we, we have a difference of opinion about how we get some of these tax provisions done uh, this year, but I appreciate his leadership. In fact, I like him so much, I try to coordinate my uh, wardrobe to look like yours on um, on hearing day, Mr. Chair. But we have an honest disagreement about timing and packaging. Um, I've had several CEOs call me uh, since I've stated my concerns with the, uh, the Wyden-Smith bill as it currently stands. Uh, and they would be uh, CEOs of companies that you all would recognize. And uh, I let them build the case for me supporting the bill. And I go on to say, I would consider you be, to be guilty of malpractice if you did not make this phone call. Because your job and your fiduciary responsibility to your, to your investors, to your employers, is to maximize your business performance. My job is to do the same for the U.S. government. And so while I understand, and none of these CEOs incidentally have an opinion on the child tax credit, the $34 trillion three-year program that arguably I think should be scored at $600 billion over 10 years, they're not taking a position on that. They're taking a position on the tax provisions. I have the unfortunate circumstance of having to take a position on both and then judging the measure on the whole. And on the whole, I think that we're making a mistake to move forward in its current form. And I hope that Senator Crapo and Senator Wyden get to a point to where I don't have to take this position. Um, we have a number of bipartisan bills uh, that have been filed, supported by Democrats and Republicans, on the tax provisions that are in this package. It is a bipartisan package. What we don't have is bipartisan agreement on a number of the tax provisions that we need to, uh, to extend next year. And I think we have to have a fulsome discussion about the entirety of the tax measures that need to be in place for us to continue to move, I think, to a positive place in terms of economic performance. Without that, it's very difficult for me to support the package as it is. I think we have to have a discussion about whether or not we're setting a precedent on future tax provisions having a pay for. Uh, we have not normally done that, uh, but we've done that in this bill to the tune of about $34 billion. So what does that mean next year when we're having a debate about two or three trillion dollars to extend the tax provisions from Jobs and Tax Cuts Act? Uh, do we get opposition uh, from my Democratic colleagues because we don't have a pay for? Because those of us believe dynamic scoring uh, will prove as it did in 2017, you create economic activity and cover it. So. The reason I don't have a question for any of you, uh, what I wanted to do was come here and explain why if you want an argument, you got to pick another subject on the tax provisions. But I alone uh, don't have the luxury of only considering the tax provisions. I have to consider child tax credit policy, want to provide uh, help uh, to people who are struggling. Not sure if this is the best way to do it. Not sure if 91% of it uh, being fully refundable is the smartest way to do it to create a sustainable uh, policy for people who need help. And I look forward to working with the chair because I consider him a good chair and the ranking member to hopefully get to a good place on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
I thank my colleague too much for me to respond, and we've got a lot of colleagues waiting. Next in order of appearance would be Senator Warren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So under President Biden, the U.S. economy has added 80,000 manufacturing jobs, partly because of tax incentives for semiconductor and clean energy manufacturing. But some tax breaks don't actually incentivize job creation. They are just corporate handouts. Right now, Congress is considering a bipartisan tax package that includes two big pieces. Number one, tax breaks for giant corporations championed by Republicans. Number two, a boost to the child tax credit to help the poorest families buy diapers and school shoes, which Democrats are fighting for. Let's take just one of the corporate tax breaks that Republicans are demanding, a more generous deduction for research and experimentation, or R&E. This break goes mainly to the largest corporations, subsidizing investments they would make anyway. And here's the kicker. Republicans want to make this break retroactive, subsidizing decisions that giant corporations made years ago. Ms. Finley, you represent the United Steelworkers who know a thing or two about American manufacturing. Is there any evidence that giving giant corporations billions in retroactive tax breaks for investments made years ago will somehow incentivize investment and create jobs? Um, I'm not aware of any. <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't have a time machine, so it's pretty hard to figure out how this could change things. So let's take a look at how these tax giveaways, who is really being benefited here. Ms. Finley, which companies would be the largest benefactors of this tax break, and how much would they receive for the R&E investments that they made back in 2022? My understanding is that the tech industry would largely be the benefactors in the order of Mill billions um, of dollars. I, I do want to underscore for manufacturers the importance of some of these business credits, right? Um, the innovation that's, that some of the, of the steel industry has been able to do to make lighter, stronger, more formidable steel has been really helpful to people. But, but that's separate from, I think, what you're talking about. Well, what I'm talking about is, as I look at the numbers now, it is two companies would receive $13 billion, that's billion with a B, in terms of a tax break here in one year. And that is more than we spend in the entire year on all federal child care funding for the entire country. At the same time that Republicans push for retroactive corporate handouts, some are fighting against a modest expansion of the CTC called the Look Back. And that would ensure that when a working family has a temporary drop in income, that their CTC benefit doesn't also drop at the same time. So, Ms. Finley, let me ask you about this. Could this happen to a steel worker? That they or their spouse could lose their job or have to cut back on hours? And the ultimate question is, should a family get less help when their income has gone down, which is what this proposal would do? I think the short answer is no, right? When a family's going through a hard time, maybe the hardest time, um, they should not get less help. And, and I think for our union, getting it right on the child tax credit is incredibly important. Um, and we, we, we strongly urge the Senate to, to do its work here. I, I appreciate that, and I, I agree with you. We do need to do our work. You know, I think we need to be clear about what's going on here. Republicans are outraged about modest help for our most vulnerable children at the same time that they are shamelessly fighting for billions of dollars in retroactive tax breaks for a handful of giant corporations. I believe that's wrong, and we shouldn't let it happen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, th I thank my colleague, uh, Senator Hassan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thanks to our witnesses for being here. Um, I want to thank the chair and, and Ranking Member Crapo for holding this important hearing uh, today. 
It's very well-timed. In January, the House overwhelmingly passed on a 357 to 70 vote, a bipartisan tax package that would boost U.S. manufacturing through the tax code. This bipartisan package would restore full and immediate deductions for R&D investments, an effort I've long worked on with Senator Young, among other major tax priorities for our manufacturers and our small businesses. In addition to supporting our domestic manufacturing sector, the bipartisan tax package would also cut taxes for hardworking families through the child tax credit. The package is a bipartisan win-win, and the Senate needs to pass it as soon as possible before we reach the end of the tax filing season in April. So I urge my colleagues to come together to clearly identify a path forward for this bill that is so important to small businesses, and I will emphasize that point, um, thousands of small businesses across the country and families all across the country. So um, I am grateful to our witnesses today because each brings to the table a unique understanding of the importance of passing this bipartisan package. Um, I want to start with a question to you, uh, Mrs. Silver, uh, because you are a small business owner, as I understand it. Uh, in your opening statement, you spoke about how incentives for research and development can help small and mid-sized manufacturers like your business. So just following up a bit on where Chair Wyden was um, asking you questions about, can you explain from your perspective how the bipartisan tax package would help small manufacturers invest in their communities and create jobs? Sure. Thank you for the question. So specifically about R&D. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have an example of that. Uh, I have been doing business with a uh, software company that provides, provides software solutions for the manufacturing industry. They have a business in Texas. I've been doing business with them for 17 years. And it's what we run our entire company on. Right. And they were dramatically affected uh, with the change in the R&D tax yeah. provisions expiring. Uh, they were they created less jobs. They had less liquidity in their company to grow, to innovate. And therefore, the product that I use every day to run my business is affected. Yeah. So it, it, like I said in my testimony, manufacturing is a team sport. Right. And so it doesn't matter what the size, the structure, if you're a C-corp, a pass-through entity like mine, we are all affected by these tax provisions. And when my large manufacturing customers do well, we do well. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Uh, to Mrs. Shannon Janice, uh, first of all, uh, just a thank you to Ansemi for having a wonderful facility in Hudson, New Hampshire. We are very proud of the work you do and grateful for the jobs uh, that you all have created there. You discussed in your opening statement how other countries are starting to outpace the United States in R&D. China, for example, offers Chinese businesses a super deduction of up to 200% of their R&D costs. Again, following up on Chair Wyden's question, how would passing the bipartisan tax package help U.S. manufacturers outcompete their counterparts in China? You're correct, Senator Hassan. China, along with other nations, provide a 200% deduction for R&D expenses. So this means that Chinese companies can deduct 200 for every 100 spent on innovation. Yeah. U.S. companies face capitalization rules that hinder immediate expensing for R&D, especially R&D salaries and wages. To enhance U.S. competitiveness, as I recommended before, I, I strongly recommend that Congress make immediate R&D expensing permanent to provide businesses with the clarity and assurance with the associated costs on R&D projects. Thank you. And finally, to Ms. Fenley, uh, the bipartisan tax package would not only boost U.S. manufacturing, as we've just been talking about, it also cuts taxes for working families through the child tax credit and helps increase affordable housing through the low-income housing tax credit. Could you please talk about how the bipartisan tax bill would benefit both businesses and hardworking families? Sure. Thank you for the question. We've talked a lot about how it would impact businesses, which obviously creates long-term um, stability for working families. Right. But of, of, of course, the child tax credit is so important yeah. um, to working families, particularly those at the margins. Um, I, I, I think it's 
incredibly important that we look at the most expansive version of that that we can to help right. lift many, many children out of poverty. No, un understood, and this is a good compromise bill. Thank you very much. I, th I thank my colleague. I'm looking around the room, and I see four champs of the research and development uh, tax uh, provision. I can't just call a vote among the four of us, but um, I can, um, the five of us, I can dream. Senator Cortez Masta. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for this great uh, discussion. I appreciate all the panel members uh, and, and the comments and the written comments. Um, let, let me, Ms. Finley, let me start with you. Um, and, and thank you for recognizing the importance of the 45X manufacturing tax credit in, in your testimony. Congress's in, intent with this credit was to provide incentives uh, for businesses to build domestic manufacturing capacity for energy components to reduce reliance on China, Russia, and other hostile nations. That's why it's key that we included critical minerals in 45X. As we all know, China dominates the market for many uh, minerals essential for defense and energy. I know my home state of Nevada has the capacity to mine and process many of the critical minerals that we need. And that's why I have been concerned uh, with Treasury's proposed rule for 45X, which excludes mineral extraction as a credible cost. Now, I know USW has also raised the same concern. Uh, would you please expand uh, upon this a little bit more and to the explanation of maybe some of my colleagues and those who are watching, why this is so important? Sure. I appreciate the question. Mining is going to be critically important to this nation as we move forward in our energy economy. Um, and as the largest mining union in the US, we want to make sure that we are passing policies that will enable that. Um, you, you're right that, that we um, uh, sent similar comments to Treasury that extraction and materials costs should be part of 45X. Um, that really has to do with, with the high costs of standing up a, a mine or a processing facility and the threats that you outlined from China. Um, there is so much potential for the mining industry at this point, um, not only because of what we have uh, in the ground, but also because of the potential for innovation. We're seeing um, all kinds of uh, minerals being extracted from waste. Um, for the first time. So I, I think that this is a really exciting space and, and I appreciate you highlighting it. Thank you and thank you for your comments. And Mr. Chair, I would like to submit for the record my comment letter on 45X signed by eight other senators as well as two industry comment letters on the same Without subject. objection, so ordered. Thank you. Ms. Janice, thanks uh, so much for your testimony regarding the importance of the semiconductor industry um, to uh, American security. Uh, listen, whether we like it or not, China is enacting policies to dominate certain industries, and there has to be a response from the U.S. and our allies. Um, I am proud Congress came together to help ensure that the U.S. maintains its advantage in ships. But there is another area which hasn't gotten as much attention, and that is rare earth magnets. Um, these are essential components of our defense systems, and yet China has a near monopoly on magnet manufacturing. Now, I have a bipartisan bill with Senator Mullen to provide tax incentives for domestic magnet manufacturing. Uh, and the bill was included as a bipartisan recommendation from the House Select Committee on China. Ms. Janice, can you speak to how important it is to see an incentive in these key industries and when, when um, you're competing with China, which is providing massive subsidies and other forms of support? Um, yes, yes, the importance of having um, tax incentives in the area of sem semiconductors is extremely important. Um, we need to drive all of that production that went offshore, we need to drive it home onshore in order to create supply chain resiliency as well as um, give our customers assurance on and consistency on their products. Thank you. And, and l let me add, and I, I, I just so appreciate this con conversation, there's more to be done. And let me ask all of you, uh, as we are looking at these tax incentives to drive industry in a certain direction, right, the clean energy, to build out, bring manufacturing back here, um, uh, one of the things is we don't want to go backward. We don't want to repeal what we've already done. But where are things that we should continue to focus? Have we, have we really, are there gaps 
in that um, supply chain? Are there gaps somewhere that we're not thinking about that we need to incentivize? To me, I'm hearing about critical components that are necessary for this clean energy economy that we want to bring the manufacturing here, but they're just not happening yet because there's no incentive to, to build out. I'm curious of your thoughts, if anybody has any thoughts on that. Yes. I said, thank you very much. I don't believe that we're being at all realistic. We don't make chips in this country. We don't mine in this country without the chemical industry. You eventually dig a hole in the ground, but you've got to process these chemicals. You've got to do something with them. And you don't do that without, without chemistry. I mean, you don't do that without new chemistry, without cleaner chemistry that, that, that can eliminate waste and, and, and the byproducts and so forth. And while we sit and we wait for years and years and years for the EPA to get approval on this, this chemistry, our chips and our mining industries, they can go overseas and build these facilities and do it cheaper. And so this is, it's not just the end product and it's not just the beginning, but it's the entire supply chain that we need to be focused on. How do we do it efficiently? How do we do it cleanly? And how do we do it profitably? Thank you. I know my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, uh, I thank my colleague next to Senator Brown. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I know we have a vote coming up and I know Mr. Daines is next. And I, I um, thank you for a really, really, really important hearing. This really matters. Uh, welcome uh, very much. Thanks for being here. Uh, Mr. Widmer, I want to first start with you, and then I want to move to the steelworkers and what they're doing. Uh, CEO First Solar was founded 25 years ago in the Glass City, Toledo. Much of the development of glass in this country was Toledo. Uh, Toledo still leads the University of Toledo, uh, took that science and made it even better, and what you've done with First Solar, I think that's the reason the location there. Uh, 25 years ago, founded, now at three factories in Ohio. They make panel wafer cell module under one roof during the company's entire existence. They've grown and innovated in the face of Chinese competitors who receive massive state subsidies, who engage in the theft of intellectual property, who wantonly, and I think wantonly is the right adverb, violate our nation's trade laws. First Solar's manufacturing activity in Ohio, along with its national supply chain, is, as you all know, supported 16,000 jobs, created $1.6 billion with a B dollars in labor income. Mr. Chair, I'd like to enter into the record a recent analysis demonstrating First Solar's tremendous economic impact with, in my with, state and all over the country. So Thank ordered. you, Mr. Chairman. The Inflation Reduction Act, as you know, included new tax incentives to support American manufacturing, the development of genuine domestic, underscore domestic supply chains for growing industries like yours. Tell us about the importance, Mr. Widmer, of the 45X advanced manufacturing credit. Yeah, it's going to be transformational to enable um, cycles of innovation that we largely have been without of for most of those 25 years. Um, First Solar is it's innovative new technology that we're able to get to scale um, and, and, and innovate to a way to create an advantage technology into the marketplace that's going to enable the world of electrification that we all envision in front of us. Um, the world of electrification, is, as I alluded to in a prior comment, starts by taking photons and making electrons. We need, it can't be a one horse race, we need to have capabilities here in the U.S. that is, has other types of technology, whether it's existing Chris and Silicon technology or evolution towards new technologies that could evolve over the next several years. And the manufacturing tax credit is going to be an enabler of doing that. That's going to allow companies to make investments, allow them to scale, and allow them to compete, right? We still need to focus on how to ensure a level playing field, but it's clearly going to allow them to compete and to scale. And by the time that the IRA runs its course, I think we're going to have a thriving domestic industry and we'll be a technology leader here in the U.S. Thank you, and thanks for the concise of that answer. Our, our tax code is supposed to, to support American manufacturing and building out the domestic supply chain that shouldn't be exploited by the Chinese Communist Party. I'm working with colleagues, as you know, uh, and on both sides of the aisle to tighten restrictions on the 45X credit to ensure that taxpayer money isn't going to Chinese companies and other foreign ent entities of concern. Um, we've passed restrictions on federal support going to foreign en entities of concern on a bipartisan basis. Would you support adding these so-called FEOCs, these FIAC restrictions on the 45X credit? Absolutely. I, I think it's nonsensical for an industry that's heavily subsidized domestically than to benefit from U.S. taxpayer dollars to fund uh, incentives here in the U.S. It doesn't make any sense to me. And how do those restrictions, how, how, will, how will that help specifically? So what I'm most uh, concerned about right now is that the, uh, 
for the decisions that are being made right now in the manufacturing that's coming into the U.S., I think is temporary in nature. It is, it is basically module assembly. It is not bringing any real technology advancements that we need here into the U.S. And it's done in such a way that all the tools are being sent from China. Um, the, the construction, in some cases, are, are just leased buildings. are not even investing in, in the, in the um, building side. And it's something that can easily be turned down and walked away from uh, when the IRA were to, be, to expire. And by doing something that's enduring that says now we're going to invest in U.S. companies that will make those capital investments with a view of making this enduring and sustainable, I think it will help us attend, uh, excuse me, achieve the intent of what the IRA was set out to do, which is to make us as a nation a technology leader in renewable energy. Uh, thank you. It's shift to my last minute um, to Ms. Finley of the USW. Uh, your testimony points out the importance of a comprehensive tax and, tax and trade agenda. You know in February the International Trade Commission ruled against an anti-dumping and countervailing duty case brought jointly by the United Steelworkers and by Cleveland Cliffs, which makes the cleanest steel in the world, I would add, one um, tin plate products produced at the facility in West, in Weirton, West Virginia. Um, talk about why we need stronger trade enforcement as a critical uh, piece of our domestic economy strategy in the last few seconds. Thank you. Sure. I'll just say that none of these policies live by themselves. They all interlocked. And um, no other organization has been a supporter or party to as many uh, anti-dumping cases as we have. Um, we know that, that trade has been um, an important factor here. Um, we would urge Congress to update our trade enforcement laws with the Leveling the Playing Field Act 2.0. Um, the other factor here for our members in Weirton who are going through possibly the worst time in their lives is they need trade, act, trade adjustment assistance, which Congress has yet to reauthorize. Thank you, Senator thank you. Brown. Thank Very you. important point. Senator Dane. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I can tell you, as somebody who spent um, most of my career in the private sector, uh, the foundation of businesses back in Montana are passed through businesses. Uh, these pass-through businesses in Montana are 95% are of all businesses. They employ a majority of workers in our country in Montana, just in, but in terms of employment, not just entities, there's 75% of private sector employees come through pass-throughs. And then back in 2017, we placed these businesses on more equal footing with their c -Corp counterparts by providing them a 20% tax deduction on qualified business income. These businesses are absolutely critical to our communities. You look at data in terms of when you come out of a recession, it's the pastors who typically take the lead on rehiring and growing and so forth faster than the C-course. And that's why I'm proud to be leading the bill that would make this deduction permanent. The Main Street Tax Certainty Act protects tens of millions of small businesses, allowing them to keep more of their profits, create more jobs, strengthen the economy. Think about the core word in capitalism is capital, and this allows these businesses to have more capital to invest, to let these businesses decide and the free markets decide where to make these capital investments versus the government taking more of those dollars and allocating in, here in this city called Washington, D.C., which most voters understand we aren't the best stewards of those resources. If we don't act to make this provision permanent, these businesses are facing an immediate 20% tax hike at the end of 2025. That's coming very soon. President Biden made it clear in his State of the Union address that he wants to increase taxes on Americans to further his agenda. In fact, just yesterday, President Biden released a reckless budget riddled with tax hikes, including an increase taxes on pass-through businesses. Under this administration, small businesses have already fought record levels of inflation, economic uncertainty. The last thing we need to do is create more uncertainty with the sunsetting of the 2017 tax bills that relates to pass-throughs and an increased tax burden of more than 20% increase. Ms. Silver, in your testimony, you share that you benefit from that 199A deduction. Could you provide some of the ways that your company reinvests the money it saves from this deduction? Thank you for the question, Senator. So that's one of our one of my favorite things to do is to reinvest in the in the company because that's what it's all about. And uh, I talked earlier about investing in machining technology and equipment, advanced robotics, passing along those savings to a customer. But I'd like to highlight another story. Another example is 
a couple years ago, we were to, we were able to take our profits and uh, create and launch a high school internship program. We call it Opportunity Knox. So it's a partnership with our local high school. 70% uh, of the students there are minority, 100% economically disadvantaged situations. And these students have never been exposed to manufacturing before. They come over for four days a week. They are on the shop floor with their mentors, their job shadowing. The fourth day, they're in our conference room, more of a classroom setting where they go through the craftsman with character curriculum, where we discuss things, virtuous skills, things like leadership, teamwork, communication. And that has been absolutely impactful not only for, um, it's been a tipping point for recruitment and retainment in our uh, machining, you know, skilled trade, but it's also just been so impactful to watch uh, men and women pour, that have been in manufacturing for 30 years, be able to pour into these students. Uh, and, and then also for the students to try on manufacturing, see if it's something they like. I have a student right now uh, who's going to graduate in May, very bright. Um, he, his parents immigrated here from Mexico. His dad's a bricklayer, and he loves machining. And he's going to continue on with us and stay full time. And I have another student who graduated last year who's now in our certified apprenticeship program. So in addition to that, I went out and bought a piece of capital equipment last year because I realized how am I going to do training and job shadowing uh, without a piece of equipment to train on. So we actually bought a piece of uh, expensive capital equipment to be able to have, to not have that in our production schedule so we can actually um, train on it yeah, as Mr. well. Yeah, Mr. what you've just demonstrated too is that your problem is trying to solve in this country in terms of more manufacturing here in America, check that box. And second, workforce development, check that box as well because you had some additional capital to invest. It works. Um, thank you for those comments. I want to, uh, as I'm wrapping up, you're talking about the federal estate tax. I think it's one of the most immoral taxes on America. If you look at the OECD, so throughout my private sector career, I spent a lot of time managing operations around the world. Uh, I think maybe sometimes it's a surprise. You realize that 40% of OECD countries don't have a death tax. I remember when I was in Australia doing business in Sydney with one of my, uh, we had an office there selling American software. I remember I said, we have this thing called a death tax in America. And they said, what in the world is that? Uh, is something that the Americans invented? 40% of OECDs don't have any estate tax. When someone loses a loved one, they shouldn't have to worry about the family business too. In addition to placing more burdens on already grieving families, the death tax is a direct threat to agriculture, and that's our number one economic driver, the farms and ranches in my great state of Montana. Um, as lawmakers look to the expiration of the 2025 tax cliff, it's really important we avoid any changes that would introduce more uncertainty. I'll tell you who benefits from all this are tax lawyers and estate planners trying to game out what's gonna happen here in Washington, D.C. Let's allow these families to continue to focus on their businesses and not have any of these elaborate estate plans because they don't know what's gonna happen here in Washington, D.C. Ms. Silver, as a third generation family owned company, could you share what a change to the estate tax exemption would do to companies like your own? And I know we're about out of time, so let's need a quick answer from you. Okay, uh, and just to talk from my own personal life, so my husband uh, passed away of brain cancer, and he was a sole shareholder owner of Ketchy. And so upon his passing, I became president and owner. And thinking back then, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it would have made sense. I don't know if even if it did make sense and I had the risk tolerance for it, if I would have been able to pay a tax liability because so much of our assets are not liquid. Um, it, I, we're in a very capital intensive business. So the impact is huge. I, I, and I don't, I, other small manufacturers should not be faced with these decisions. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry on your loss as well. Thank, thank you, you for your comments. Yeah, you can only imagine what it's like for a spouse to walk into a situation like that where husband and wife have been working on it together for years and then suddenly their future is shattered. So we all think about that. Now, um, under normal circumstances, I would either shoot baskets or something in order to stall for Senator Young for a couple of minutes or 
um, find some other diversion. But I had one other question, and then we'll wait for Senator Young in all seriousness. The House of Representatives actually voted to repeal the IRA altogether. What would be the impact of your uh, work if that was to pass the Senate and it was to, to vanish? Maybe we start with uh, you, Mr. Widmer, you, Ms. Fendley, but we're, we're waiting for Senator Young and, uh, and I'll... So, uh, for, so from our standpoint, if the IRA were to, to be repealed in its entirety, um, it would basically bring us to a complete stop because we would not have clarity of the policy environment um, and how to continue to operate and grow, grow our business and continue to invest in, in R&D. Uh, we need that long-term vision and understanding to make informed decisions today. Ms. Fenley. I completely agree. The IRA is part of, a, of our industrial policy. It provides um, both supply side and demand side levers to help manufacturers have certainty moving forward, make decisions moving forward. Um, it, it would frankly be devastating if, if that was repealed, um, not only for manufacturing, but it, the IRA includes other important provisions like letting Medicare negotiate drug prices for the first time that, that will really impact seniors' pocketbooks in, in, a, in a positive way. So, you know, we would, we would certainly fight, uh, fight back on a, a repeal effort. We uh, will also be looking at health care some, some more. I was co-director of the Oregon Gray Panthers for about seven years back when I had a full head of hair and rugged good looks. And we started talking about those kinds of uh, drug policy reforms. And now we're finally reaping the fruits of it. We're seeing, for example, in this room, we drafted the provision that I call the price gouging penalty, where the companies raise their prices over inflation. They pay a penalty. But He's worth waiting for. Senator Young is here, and uh, I've appreciated all his leadership, particularly when you looked across the room and you saw Senator Young and Senator Hassan. They've been the bipartisan uh, leadership here on uh, R&D, and we appreciate it. Senator Young. Well, I, I thank the good chairman for his leadership on, on this and other issues. I know that some of my Republican colleagues uh, have highlighted the impact of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, it, it has bolstered the U.S. economy, it has encouraged U.S. innovation, and as we've heard today, these pro-growth tax policies have driven growth in not just the manufacturing sector, but in countless other sectors as well. But today, I, I want to focus on another important piece of legislation that has increased U.S. global competitiveness and benefited the U.S. economy, and there is... Uh, pretty significant bipartisan support here in Congress, but also back home for it. It's called the Chips and Science Act. Uh, it's, it's a piece of legislation that Senator Schumer and I saw through the congressional process, was signed into law. It authorized $53 billion worth of incentives for private companies investing in semiconductor manufacturing, R&D, and workforce development. And since the bill was passed in 2022, the semiconductor industry has announced over $240 billion in private sector investment. Now, almost none of the public money has even flowed, and we've seen $240 billion unlocked um, in the production of, of both foundational and leading-edge microchips. The CHIPS Act, as, as we call it, uh, also established the Microelectronic Commons Program, uh, under which my home state of Indiana uh, has been designated the leader of Silicon Crossroads Microelectronics Hub. This regional partnership was designed to accelerate the prototyping in advanced, uh, of advanced microchips. The hub will bolster private investments that will secure uh, our country's advantage in leading edge semiconductor design. Of course, very important to our national security. This and other partnerships has, have already drawn more than $2 billion in publicly announced investments into the state of Indiana alone. So great things are, are being made in Indiana thanks to the passage of the CHIPS Act. And um, I'd, I'd like to use that lead-in to ask Ms. Janice to start. 
Can you please share how you've seen the Chips and Science Act empower chip manufacturers like OnSemi to invest in emerging technologies in the United States? Thank you, Senator Young. OnSemi is investing in the next generation development of image sensors and analog signal semiconductors at our domestic manufacturing facility in East Fishkill, New York. We plan to qualify and manufacture at this facility starting in 2025. Remaining cost competitive is, a, is key in delivering onshore production capability. This will, supply, this will provide supply assurance to OnSemi's customers who currently depend on foreign production sites and will enable automotive and industrial grade products with increased performance in automation technology. Thank you for that, Ms. Janice. And uh, uh, it, 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 for those who are in the semiconductor uh, design and production business, like on semi, uh, you know that we can't develop and strengthen our, our domestic chips production without a prepared and ready workforce. Indiana's esteemed colleges and universities are ensuring that not only are great technological advancements made in Indiana, but the innovators and leaders of tomorrow are made there too. Uh, as, as Secretary of State Blinken said when he came and visited the state of Indiana not too long ago, uh, we have a, a, a talent fab in Purdue University and in Ivy Tech Community College. Purdue, in, in fact, has established its Semiconductor Degrees Leadership Board to solicit input and guidance from industry leaders to ensure that Purdue graduates have the skills they need to succeed in their careers and Don Semi is a member of that board. So thank you, Ms. Janice. Ms. Janice, can you please explain how university uh, industry partnerships like the Semiconductor Degrees Leadership Board at Purdue improve worker readiness and allow companies like On Semi to continue innovating? Absolutely. On Semi, workforce development is critically important. On Semi actively recruits top talent, of course, wherever it can be found. We have an active college recruiting program with 11 prefer preferred schools, including Purdue. The list also includes Penn State, Texas A&M, as well as Prairie View A&M University and Howard University two HBCUs. OnSemi has committed more than 8.5 million to university programs and is actively working with universities in the US on workforce development. Last year in STEAM education grants, OnSemi awarded one, over 1.3 million to help students in underserved communities focusing on semiconductor awareness at middle schools. Thank you, Ms. Janice, to you and, and to OnSemi uh, for that testimony today. Thanks again to our witnesses. I see I'm out of time. Uh, before I uh, pass it back to the chairman, I'd just like to go on record once again uh, and, and indicate the importance from my uh, lights that we uh, restore the business's ability to full and immediately deduct uh, uh, the expense for research and development costs under Section 174 of the tax code. I know the chairman has, has helped uh, uh, negotiate a, a, a deal that would include that provision, and uh, I will submit questions on this uh, uh, for the benefit of our witness to the record. Thank you. Well, th thank my colleague, and, and before you go, I think, Senator Young, what your name is now synonymous with is innovation. If you look at your agenda and what you've done with chips and competition with China, with respect to AI, I just so appreciate it because I think that as we look at tax policy, tax policy is really about innovation and fairness. Those are the two most important kind of ideas. And I'm, I'm just going to say as I close today that I want to touch on couple of points with respect to what we're about to vote on and put in the record some non-political material. The Joint Committee on Taxation is the group that we use around here to do objective, non-political analysis. And we wanted them particularly to look at this issue of what our work is going to mean for work generally, because some of those who have criticized this, it's going to discourage work, that it is somehow going to cause people to walk out of the workforce and just see if they can get $1,000 or $1,500 or, or something, and then maybe they'll jump back into the workforce some other uh, time. 
The Joint Committee on Taxation rejects this argument that our bill will discourage work. They say, and I will quote it, the proposed expansion of the child tax credit on net increases labor supply. That's the view of people who aren't trying to grind a political ax and aren't saying, well, we're Democrats or Republicans. That's what they're saying. And I'm going to ask unanimous consent to put the entire document into the record. They go on to talk about whether this sample size is the right size and the like, but they have been specific with respect. They do not believe that this will discourage um, work. And what I take out of here, because I listened to everybody having budge for two hours like you, thank you very much, Every one of you, witnesses representing communities across the country, have said specifically, because I asked you and other colleagues did as well, you said it would be bad for your businesses and your workers to postpone this legislation, the Tax Relief for Americans, Families, and Workers Act. There was no ambiguity in that. You all said it would be a mistake, a mistake for workers and uh, businesses. And the reality is we know we're going to have a big, big tax debate in 2025. Senator Young and I have, have talked about it, and everybody's going to go at it, and that's what our system of government is all about. But the question becomes, are we going to harm businesses and families and workers like yours when we have a bipartisan bill that got so many votes in the House of Representatives that when people read it initially, Senator Young, they thought they'd read the wrong number. They thought that maybe there was a mistake in the number. You don't get 357 votes for getting a soda at this point. So you have really, I think, been a very important contribution to, uh, to this debate. And as long as I'm in public service, I'm going to try to work as hard as I can with senators like uh, uh, Todd Young of Indiana, because I think if you're innovating, and you're working to try to find, find common ground, that's what public service is all about. So thank you all for giving us a chance to get this input, get it on the record as we move to uh, the final efforts to try to get this uh, passed and passed uh, uh, quickly, a bipartisan piece of legislation. Everybody gives speeches about being bipartisan, gives speeches about doing something about research and, uh, and competing with China. We're going to give them a chance to have that opportunity. With that, I thank you. We're adjourned.